you, Judy, um, and thanks to the other organizers. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to see a lot of uh, old friends. Um, so I want to talk about uh, imprinting, and a lot of a lot of today's story is going to be about the 1918 Spanish flu. And so we are uh, almost to the the week, a uh, hundred years on from. Uh, w when the world realized that uh, they had another influenza pandemic on their hands and one that uh, became famously uh, disastrous. Um, and what I want to do first is just to contrast what happened in 1918 with sort of a typical year for, for flu. So these are US numbers. Um, so seasonal flu, you can have anywhere from 5 to the sometimes 20% of the population infected. Uh, and in an average year, uh, that results in about 30 million outpatient visits uh, in the US, which is quite a few. Three million hospitalized days if you tally everything up, and a $90 uh, billion dollar, uh, price tag. So it's a serious thing even in a regular season, uh, and can kill more than 30,000 people. Uh, interestingly, it's very uh, variable, so some seasons uh, there's hardly any excess mortality. Those seasons tend to be dominated by H1N1 viruses. Um, so like a lot of people, um, uh, I wanted to, uh, and like a lot of people in this room, wanted to try to figure out um, what made this uh, outbreak so, so bad. Um, uh, and just to set this up, um, this, this book here is a very good history, one of the first proper histories of, of the 1918 pandemic, written by a guy named Alfred Crosby. And he hadn't heard of the 1918 Spanish flu back in the 70s. And he was giving a talk somewhere in uh, the state of Washington. Uh, and before his talk, he was in a room with almanacs. And he pulled an almanac off the wall from 1917 and looked up life, life expectancy in the US, and it was about 52 years old, 52 years. Uh, pulled one from 1919, about the same, and then looked at one from 1918, and it was 42. And so his question was, what the hell happened? Um, and we now know, uh, of course, that this was a, a, a pandemic uh, uh, caused by flu. And, and just to compare to that 30,000 number, uh, in the space of about, mostly in about uh, a six week period in the US, you had 675,000 dead, uh, maybe something like 50 million dead worldwide. Uh, so a very severe flu outbreak um, and one that was quite unusual for targeting people in um, adulthood. So unlike uh, previous uh, and, and seasonal flu, um, where you have this U-shaped mortality curve with uh, most of the impact felt in the very young and the very old, in 1918, uh, you had this peak of mortality in young adults. So the question since 1918 has been why? Uh, so we now know a lot of the, the key clues uh, as, as to why, and some of them are, uh, again, you have this mortality peak in young adults, but you also have troughs in mortality that you need to explain. Uh, so why is it that the same virus that kills young adults um, actually spared the very elderly, who are usually the group at, at highest risk of dying from a flu infection? Uh, so there's actually negative excess mortality uh, if you were older than about 75 years old. You died, uh, you had a, a lower risk of dying in 1918 than in 19. 14 from, from seasonal flu. Um, despite uh, the stories uh, that we've all heard about people uh, turning blue and dropping dead a few hours after being infected, actually most deaths in 1918, just like most deaths, deaths from flu now, uh, were caused by secondary bacterial infections, um, so people getting pneumonia. Uh, a week or two or three weeks after infection. Uh, and we know from the work of uh, Jeff Taubenberger and colleagues uh, that this was an H1N1 virus. Uh, and, and until pretty recently, 
there was really very little hard evidence about where this H1N1 virus came from. Taubenberger and colleagues um, suggested that it was a wholesale jump from birds into humans. Um, uh, but others have proposed that the virus moved from swine into humans. Um, we do know that uh, birds uh, have a tremendous reservoir uh, of uh, viral diversity for influenza A virus. But really, uh, exactly when this virus emerged, from what reservoir, and where, even to a hemisphere, hasn't, hasn't been well understood at all. Uh, so a, a few years ago now, uh, Andrew uh, Rombo, who's in the audience, uh, and my PhD student, now Professor uh, Guanju Han, and I published a couple of papers that answered some of these questions. Um, and uh, the first thing that we did actually is, is looked at a whole bunch of influenza phylogenies for a long time uh, and realized that there was an issue with the rate at which the virus evolves in different uh, host species that perhaps wasn't being dealt, uh, dealt with uh, with the molecular clock methods that um, we had all been using. Um, and just to illustrate that, uh, what I've got here, this is actually a, a time tree, so these branch links are in units of time, not in um, uh, evolutionary changes. But what you can see is if, if you actually allow the viruses evolving in different host species to have their own clock rate, um, that there can be some pretty dramatic differences. So the horse viruses are evolving at a much slower rate than bird viruses. And what happens if you don't take that into account with a, an explicit host-specific local molecular clock, um, you'll get really, really big errors both in topology and in the, the timing estimates. So this horse lineage, this obscure horse lineage, and actually, if you don't mind, can you just put your hands up, hand up if you've heard of H7N7 in, in horses, just to give me an idea? Okay, so that's an un, unusual proportion of <laughs> the audience. Um, what, happen, what will happen if you don't uh, explicitly account for these clocks is that this lineage will pop up somewhere around there, and for, it would look for all the world like this was a fairly recent jump from birds into horses. Um, and I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on that paper um, uh, or the, the bias, uh, but what you find for most of the genome segments, once you account for this, uh, is you, you keep finding this structure here where the avian diversity is actually a sister group uh, to this fairly deeply branching equine lineage. Um, and the avian diversity tends to fall into uh, eastern and western hemisphere clades. And it's all quite, the genetic diversity is quite young uh, for the most part in the birds with this node two dating to somewhere mid to late 1800s. So uh, quite at odds with the idea of a primordial virus in birds that's been around for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. Uh, most of the genetic diversity actually is about as old as the telephone. Uh, once we had these methods, the, the thing to apply them to was the 1918 virus. And so now um, I want to take you through this slide here uh, and, and this story that starts as a kind of phylogenetic exercise in just trying to get the trees right. Um, opened up a kind of window onto uh, this, this thing that's in my title, this idea that the first virus, uh, influenza A virus that you have as a kid, might really set you up for your, your whole lifetime uh, in, in pretty profound ways. So this is the, the slide that really took us to that uh, inference. Again, the viruses in different hosts evolve at different rates. Um, the avian uh, lineage here um, uh, is in hemispheric clades. But really what I want you to see is the difference uh, between 
viruses from 1918 and viruses in the human lineage that were sampled from the 1930s onwards. Uh, and what you might be able to see is that instead of um, looking like uh, direct descendants of the 1918 virus, the human viruses actually are off on a, a branch that shares a common ancestor quite far back in time with the pandemic lineage. Uh, whereas the swine flu, the H1N1 lineage in swine, really does look like uh, it may have received its hemagglutinin uh, gene directly from a 1918 pandemic virus. So one inference here is that actually the phylogenetic evidence seems to suggest um, uh, that the pig, the pig virus uh, was not the source of the 1918 pandemic. It was probably something that emerged from the human virus. Uh, but if you took a snapshot in time in 1918, the most parsimonious uh, explanation for what we see here is that actually this hemagglutinin had been circulating in humans for some years before 1918. And that small little uh, kind of uh, esoteric point coming out of the phylogeny then suggested uh, an explanation for some of these patterns that you see in, in, in the mortality because if you, uh, the incidence of influenza is very high in, in, in the very young. So if you were born around 1900 and indeed an H1 virus was circulating in humans uh, around that time, the chance is very high that you saw that as your first virus. And so if you're uh, 12 years old in 1918, uh, perhaps the virus that's causing this horrible pandemic is one that's antigenically related to something you saw as your first virus as a kid. And maybe that's why there's a trough in mortality in that age group. And, and the hemagglutinin, uh, the deep uh, d uh, uh, time to the most recent common ancestor in the hemagglutinin is really uh, different, that pattern's different than all of the other seven segments that you uh, look at in, in the genome. And for all of the other seven segments, uh, all of the genetic diversity in the, in the mammals coalesces to a point somewhere around 1915. So if you accept that this virus moved from humans into pigs, and you look at these numbers here, it also suggests that maybe, maybe that virus actually didn't emerge in humans right in 1918. If this was all you had to look at, you'd probably conclude that that virus had emerged somewhere closer to 1915. And we'll, we'll get back to that at the end of, end of the talk. Um, but the HA gene, again, is not like the others. Uh, there's a suggestion that humans may have been infected with an H1 virus. Uh, uh, a decade or more prior to the pandemic. And so let's just follow that, uh, that idea through and look at its possible consequences. So here, if you look at excess mortality, um, and this is compared to a baseline of, of several seasonal flu years prior to 1918, uh, this is the pattern that you get. So again, older folks are actually protected and other people had already uh, suggested that maybe the reason that the elderly did so well in the midst of the worst uh, flu pandemic in human history is perhaps as kids or as, uh, uh, at some point earlier in their life, they'd been exposed to something antigenically related to this virus. So, so that idea was not new. Um, but what we added to it is, is this idea that perhaps the, the trough in mortality in younger folks uh, was due also to exposure to an antigenically related virus. And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of things start to, to kind of uh, support that idea. So the phylogenies lend some support to that idea. Um, the, 
the serological evidence is, is pretty interesting. I'm not going to show it, but um, if you actually do serological assays where you use a seasonal flu virus from the 1930s rather than uh, the swine virus from the 1930s, which is uh, what most people look at when they look at reactivities to H1, uh, there's, a, there's a pretty strong peak in reactivities to people born around, you know, 1900 to 1910. Um, again, suggesting that maybe as kids they were exposed to something sort of like the seasonal flu uh, lineage. Um, and so what we proposed in the uh, 2014 paper was maybe this is what's going on. Maybe what matters uh, to your outcome in terms of severity to something like the 1918 Spanish flu is, uh, is it sort of the same uh, as what you were exposed to as a kid, or is it different? And I may have a phylogeny here. Um, people had already noticed uh, that there are conserved epitopes uh, some of them on the stem domain of the hemagglutinin uh, that break the reactivities into, into uh, two, two major groups that follow the phylogeny here. So H3, the human virus, uh, is over on this uh, major branch of the tree that we call group 2 hemagglutinin. Uh, H1 uh, as well as H2 the human viruses uh, are over in this other group. And, and so it's, it starts to make some sense if your first exposure as a kid is to an H3-like virus. And it turns out there's very persuasive seroarchaeological evidence uh, that people born back at this time period here who were the same cohort that had this really sharp peak in mortality in 1918, uh, there's pretty strong serological evidence that uh, these people were first exposed to an H3 virus and probably an H3N8 virus. Um, so there's, in fact, let me just go to this slide here. Uh, if you look at just the, the relative presence of uh, reactivities to an H3 virus, in these different age groups. You see this peak in red uh, in about 28 year olds. Uh, and that coincides with the previous undisputed pandemic uh, in 1890, the Russian flu of 1890. Uh, and if you, if you look at the pattern in H3 antibodies, and then you overlay completely independent data of who's dying from flu in 1918, uh, it's pretty similar. Like, it's hard to look at that and say there's no relationship between these things. Um, that the, the very peak in mortality uh, occurs in the cohort with the strongest evidence of having been imprinted uh, to a virus over on the wrong part of the phylogeny. Okay, so is that, is that making sense? Um, so that's the basic inference that we proposed in this 2014 paper uh, is if you've got a, a virus that's killing some age groups and sparing other age groups, maybe rather than looking to the virus itself and trying to, to figure out what made this virus, virus virulent, uh, maybe what you need to be looking at is uh, the history of exposure and how immunity is actually shaping these severity patterns. Uh, and again, it explains not only the peak in mortality in young adults, uh, but it offers an exp explanation for why there would be troughs in mortality either side of that peak. And as we were finishing that paper up, um, we, we started thinking about how this pattern actually might apply not just to the 1918 virus, but to other viruses uh, as well. And others had already noticed uh, 
that uh, deaths and severe cases from these avian origin H5N1 and H7N9 viruses uh, were really in different age groups. And so in that paper, now I'm going to ha have, uh, this is going to be a, a real measure of your expertise. How many people have seen supplementary figure 15 <laughs> from our paper? A see, Andrew's hand didn't even go up, and he's a co-author. <laughs> um, so, so we snuck this in, actually, um, uh, just because it occurred to us that uh, this is, this idea that the virus that you have first as a kid might really shape your outcome really did appear to be explaining things beyond 1918. And so what we did is we just tallied, we, we grabbed whatever data uh, were handy um, and, and looked at some H5 uh, deaths from Indonesia in blue uh, and some H7 deaths uh, uh, from China in orange here. And we just asked, are these viruses affecting uh, age, uh, people born either side of 1968 in different ways? So why 1968? 1968 is when the group 2 hemagglutinin, uh, H3, in the H3N2 virus, emerged uh, and for a decade was the only virus. Um, and from 1968 on, onward has been uh, the virus that's accounted for most first infections. Um, and before 1968, everyone uh, would have been exposed in the human population either to an H2 or an H1 virus uh, that's over in group one. And it's a close relative of, of the avian H5 viruses. So the idea is if your f uh, first infection as a kid was to a, a, a close relative of H5, even though it's a novel subtype, does that provide protection when you're later exposed to an H5 virus? And vice versa for H7, does H3 exposure as a group two antigen, does that set you up for a lifetime of being protected against H7? Uh, and there's a pretty strong suggestion uh, in the data that this was the case, that in Indonesia, at least, the only people dying from H5 were younger people who were more likely exposed to the mismatched hemagglutinin as a kid. And similarly, it's not as clean, uh, but people dying from H7 tend to be people born prior to 68, and as kids, they would have had one of the blue viruses as their first virus, an uh, H2 or an H1. Um, so I went and, and, uh, and visited uh, Jamie Lloyd Smith and his group uh, a year or two after that paper, or I guess a year after that paper was published. Uh, and we talked about this supplemental figure 15 pattern. Uh, and, uh, and these guys who are, are, are really good mathematical epidemiologists uh, then went to work on this, and, and, uh, and Katie, in particular, gathered up all of the cases that she could find of H7N9 or H5N1, um, and then we just, uh, and, and it, it was published uh, uh, in 2016, um, and, and the idea is this. You can actually reconstruct pretty well um, what virus different cohorts, different age groups were exposed to as kids. Prior to 1968, it's pretty simple because the only viruses circulating were group one viruses. Um, but it's not a total clean break. Um, you can be born a few years before 1968 and still actually see the 1968 H3 virus as your first virus. If you make it to four or five or six years old before your first flu infection, uh, then you can actually imprint on something that emerged a few years after you were born. Uh, after 1977, it becomes more complicated because both H1 and H3 viruses have co-circulated. 
Um, but just roughly speaking, um, if you don't mind putting your hand up if you were born before 68. So in this room, the minority uh, uh, of, the, of the population would have, if this idea has something going for it, would have protection um, against H7, but vulnerability to H5. And then hands up if you were born after 68. And so in this room, if, again, if this idea has something going for it, um, we have some pretty substantial herd immunity um, against, uh, I, I think I, I said it the wrong way, um, uh, but people born after 68, most of whom will have been infected with an H3 virus, will have protection against an H7 virus. And what you can do is then overlay this, if the only thing explaining these patterns was this idea that the very first influenza A virus that you have sets you up in a, in a way that you can recall that um, preferentially uh, in a way that protects you against viruses from the same branch, the, the same clade of the evolutionary tree. If, if that's all you have, then this is the relationship of, of that prediction with the actual data. So this is actual case numbers uh, plotted by birth year. And that was, that was another thing that we set out in, that, in the 2014 PNAS paper, is maybe what you want to look at is the year that the person's born rather than the age that they are. Um, because if this really is, is something that is tracking different cohorts through time, you want to track those cohorts by birth year because you'll lose that if you, if you plot uh, severity of flu by age, um, you'll, you'll completely miss these sorts of patterns. Because um, the idea, again, let's go back to the, the cohort who did so poorly as young adults in 1918. There's indirect evidence, but pretty persuasive evidence uh, that they were exposed as kids to an H3 virus. So in 1918, that's the worst possible immune history that you could have. And uh, those people died in large numbers, but not all of them died. Worldwide, less than 5% of, of people, even in that 28-year-old peak mortality uh, uh, age group, uh, died, so most of them survived. And what you see is in 1968, when an H3 virus emerges again, that that age group had uh, almost complete protection. There was almost no mortality if you were born um, in b between about 1890 and 1900, and you made it to 1968 your chance of dying from the 68 H3N2 virus was, was almost nil. Okay, so, so now let's look at these case counts. Uh, mortality is in dark. Uh, severe incidence, uh, incidence of severe infection is in the lighter color for both of these. In the H5N1, you can really see uh, that 1968 is this dividing line. And, and in, in fact, most of the cases of H5N1 uh, when you tally up all of the data are occurring in the age group that matches this 1918 kind of idea of uh, imprinting. Uh, and so you can also just plot the virus uh, or, or, or the, the, the data as ab above or below zero, where zero um, would be just the number of cases in that birth year that you would expect um, just by that birth year's proportion of the population, okay? And so excess mortality, in fact, for the H3-related virus in people exposed to um, H1 or H2, and vice versa. Kind of close to mirror images, again, around, uh, 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 either side of this 1968. And so now I'm going to plot in, in black lines, just the prediction uh, based on 
these patterns that we reconstructed of for every birth year cohort, what proportion of that birth year cohort would have had either a group one, H1, H2 infection as a kid, or a group two, H3 infection. And so that's the relationship. Um, and again, these are independent of the, of the actual case data. But that's pretty, um, we found that pretty remarkable that um, just knowing the year that someone is born seems to be giving you a lot of information about whether they're likely to die from these avian origin viruses and, and the peaks uh, in the actual mortality and severe incidence uh, do match the, the expectations of falling in birth years who would have been exposed to the wrong virus as kids. And it's actually um, remarkably symmetrical. Uh, so Katie and, 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 and Jamie and, and, and crew uh, then went on to, to devise mathematical models where you put this imprinting as one possible factor that could be explaining the, the actual data. Uh, and you allow for other um, proposed explanatory factors. Like maybe H5N1 is killing younger folks, younger kids, uh, just because for some reason younger kids are coming into contact with H5 viruses more frequently than adults. Um, maybe H7 is killing adults because adults are coming into contact with that virus more frequently. Um, maybe each of these viruses just has an innate predisposition to affecting different age groups. But when you put everything in the model, um, this imprinting uh, on HA does seem to be the dominant factor, uh, and the protection is, is uh, the same. So regardless of what age you are when you die from H5N1 or H7N9, uh, it looks like the first infection that you have as a kid from seasonal human viruses provides about 80%, 75 to 80% protection against severe disease and about 80% protection against death. Um, and it's kind of, in a way, good news because it means that uh, if you think back to when we put up our hands uh, in this room, we have uh, probably a huge amount of uh, immunity to an H7 virus. And if you now think about it from the perspective of pandemic emergence, not only does a new flu virus, to be successful, need to have an ecological opportunity to jump from animals into humans, and not only does there have to be some sort of evolutionary angle where the virus either has to uh, come pre-adapted for um, infecting human cells and transmitting efficiently, or it has to very quickly uh, gain those uh, mutations uh, after cross-species transmission. So not only do you have ecology and evolution shaping emergence, but now there's this other component of immunity. A new flu virus is not arising on a completely blank slate. Uh, it's actually arising and, and needing to emerge in populations that have considerable herd, herd immunity. And so you can start to think about, okay, uh, as, as populations age, we've, uh, in this room, we have uh, a lot of herd immunity uh, that probably will make the emergence of an H7 virus more difficult uh, than an H1 vi virus, or an H5 virus, rather. Uh, and that shifts through time as, as human uh, populations uh, age out and, and uh, older generations exposed to H1 and H2 become a smaller and smaller proportion of the population. Uh, that will probably shift the likelihood of emergence of new flu pandemics from group one to group two. And you can start to sort of forecast in time uh, 
um, these likelihoods, and we, uh, we, we do that in the paper. Um, so one of the implications of, of this uh, idea that started with, again, these esoteric reconstructions of the 1918 uh, viruses, eight genome segments, um, is that um, not new, new pandemics are probably regulated by this same imprinting that we see shaping severity of infection. Uh, and that birth year actually gives us a nice handle to try to, uh, to some degree, predict um, what might happen. Uh, and, and the way I put it here is that instead of looking to the virus, which people have since that first virus genome segment was, was published, I think, in 1999 from the 1918 virus, uh, and, um, and the publication uh, sort of, it was sort of a letdown because all of this work went into reconstructing this uh, H1 sequence from the 1918 virus and there was nothing in the sequence that suggested an answer to, to what happened in 1918. Uh, but if this imprinting thing uh, is part of the answer, then for all of us, one die is already cast in childhood. Each of us had one and only one first influenza A infection. Um, for certain age groups, there's no doubt what it, what it was. For people born after about 1977, um, there's currently no way of knowing for sure uh, if your first virus, uh, first flu infection was H3 or H1. Um, but there's this indication that that actually matters for um, your immunity to future um, pandemic viruses. And then another die is cast after infection. So you get a flu infection, um, but perhaps what decides um, or impacts whether you live or die is, for example, whether you're one of the 30 million people who show up to the doctor feeling crappy uh, and end up being prescribed antibiotics. And so as an evolutionary biologist, it's my great pleasure to suggest that overprescription of antibiotics might protect a lot of people from secondary bacterial infections uh, and dying from, uh, indirectly from influenza. Uh, and that might be, that, I think that probably is one of the things uh, that has changed from since 1918. Uh, and that's one reason to think that a, all else being equal, if you took exactly the same scenario in 1918 and you, you played it out today, um, you would almost certainly have much lower mortality just because uh, of people getting antibiotics, sometimes s sort of blindly prescribed antibiotics. Um, and so let me just leave that. Um, and, and move on. I've got one more component uh, to the talk here to get us back to 1918 and, and the years around 1918. Um, so another interesting observation is that uh, if you tally up deaths from seasonal flu, H3 is much, much more dangerous than H1. If, if it's a season in the US where 30,000 or 40,000 people die from Influenza A, it's an H3, N2 year for sure. Um, years that are dominated by H1N1 tend to be very low mortality years. So why is that? Well, one possibility, again, is that the first infection that you get as a kid might be shaping the severity of your outcome to seasonal flu as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and um, the elderly age group who's most susceptible to these sorts of secondary bacterial infections. <clears throat> Speaking of secondary bacterial infections, one's come on since I started talking. Um, that, uh, that maybe the reason that H3 is, is the more dangerous virus is not something intrinsic to H3. Maybe it's because the current older, more susceptible cohort was exposed to H1 or H2 as kids. 
Um, and that's something that we're now looking at with, with data from uh, the state of Arizona. Um, and there does seem to be an indication that that's the case, but it's nowhere near as clear a pattern as H5N1 and H7N9. Um, what's the immune mechanism? We suspect that uh, this, this may be driven by uh, antibodies uh, binding epitopes on this conserved stem domain of the HA. Um, and I said that it's good news that we, that, that we have immunity to novel viruses. Um, it's also potentially bad news for universal flu vaccines. Um, if you look at age groups born before 1968, they're very, again, they're very susceptible uh, to dying from H7 viruses. They were exposed as kids to H1 or H2, which are mismatched viruses, so that makes sense. But these people here, you know, if you were born in <clears throat> 1964, um, you've, you've lived through the same era that someone born in 1969 has lived through. And you've probably been exposed to H3 viruses on more than one occasion. But evidently, that ex exposure, if it wasn't your first exposure, or, or perhaps the first of a couple of exposures, that's not giving you um, this protection uh, that you see in people who were exposed for the first time to H3. And that means that a universal flu vaccine, if you want to replicate this sort of protection, um, might, you might run up against uh, this issue where it's very difficult to modify whatever your immune response uh, based on your first natural infection was. Um, and this then raises this question of um, if, there's, if, if, if it's so important what virus you had first as a kid, um, how does vaccinating kids play into this? If your first uh, exposure to antigens of influenza A virus are from a vaccine, ex for example, a killed vaccine, um, does that give you the same sort of lifelong immunity that we're seeing shaping H5N1 and H7N9 patterns? Um, probably not. For a universal flu vaccine to work, would you actually need to give it to completely immunologically naive kids? Maybe, maybe those of us who've already had our first infection, it's too late to modify it? I think these are important questions that we're gonna um, start seeing answers to uh, in, in future years. And NIH has actually just um, committed a fairly substantial amount of funding uh, to following cohorts um, from birth onwards and tracking what antigens they see first and how does that shape future severity, uh, not just to um, novel pandemic uh, or, or future possible pandemic viruses, but to seasonal viruses. Okay. Let me now end with um, some pretty speculative um, uh, discussion of, so the phylogenetic pattern suggests that there, there was maybe up to two or three years of circulation of the pandemic virus before 1918. If you just looked at the phylogenetic data, that's, that's what you would uh, conclude. There are lots of reasons to think that the 1918 virus emerged very close to maybe just a few months before it was noticed, because how could something that has that dramatic an impact have circulated for years before it was noticed? Um, but I think it is possible that this virus was under the radar for a, a longer period of time uh, than is currently thought plausible. And hands up if, you've, if you're aware of this paper. Okay, good job, Martha. Um, 
This, I think, is a really important and, and overlooked paper. Uh, so Don Olson and Lona Simonson and, and colleagues went back to public health data from New York City. Uh, and, and what they found was that in very early 1918, like February, there was already an indication of this sort of so-called W-shaped mortality curve where there was a bump up in adult mortality. Uh, and so for starters, this paper just completely blows out of water, the water uh, the one hypothesis that I think most um, people on the street that have some knowledge of the 1918 uh, pandemic will be able to recall. So this idea that maybe this started in, in Haskell County, Kansas. This is John Barry's idea from his book, The Great Influenza. Um, uh, there was an early outbreak uh, in Camp Funston, um, a, a military camp in, in the spring of 1918. And John Barry found uh, or sort of rediscovered this really remarkable report to um, the sort of um, early version of uh, MMWR, um, public health reports. Uh, so a, a, a family doctor in the middle of nowhere in Kansas noted a, a very severe flu outbreak in the, also in the spring of 1918. Uh, and that gave rise to this idea that Kansas is, is where the epidemic started. The problem with that is this paper. This paper shows us that um, already in the spring of 1918, New York City was uh, experiencing uh, almost certainly the 1918 pandemic because there was this bump in mortality in young adults. Okay, so that shows us, A, that the, the, the virus um, could have been circulating under the radar for longer than we realized. Um, and, and, and B, um, that it certainly was doing that specifically in North America. Okay, so now how many people are familiar with these two papers from The Lancet in 1917? Okay, so these are really cool papers. Um, uh, there was an outbreak uh, that was noticed independently by two military groups, one in Etap, which was the major hospital center behind the Western Front during World War I. Uh, and in the midst of all of the stuff that they had to do uh, during World War I, these guys here uh, published a paper in The Lancet uh, talking about this outbreak of what they called purulent bronchitis. Uh, but over and over again talked about cyanosis, this, this sort of defining feature, um, this telltale sign of, of the 1918 Spanish flu. Um, that was followed up by this other group saying, hey, we're seeing the same thing in Aldershot, uh, in army barracks uh, in the UK. And a few years ago, I figured, well, if there are any samples that remain from this study, even though the hospitals were demobilized about two weeks after, <clears throat> excuse me, after the end of World War I, um, the pathologist on the paper would be the person to retain those samples. And I'm, and I'm always trying to find old samples. Um, and uh, so there's, there's one of them there. Um, and and the, the way I got that, it's now sitting in my lab in, in Tucson. We haven't screened it yet, but I, um, I cyber-stalked the granddaughter of the pathologist one, <laughs> one night. Um, so I, I found an obituary of the pathologist from the Lancet paper, and then an obituary of the son of, uh, of, of that guy. And that obituary was written by the husband of his granddaughter, who's now a collaborator, his name is Jim Cox. Um, and, and so I found his name, um, and then I found someone's blog post about running into Jim and Fiona Cox trekking in Nepal, and what a coincidence to, to find someone from this tiny little village in the Lake District. 
Uh, and so with that bit of geographical information, I got an email address from Jim and sent him an email saying, this is going to sound crazy if you're not the Jim Cox that I think you are, but if you're married to the granddaughter of the guy that uh, published that paper in The Lancet, uh, I'd love to chat with you because it would be great to see if any uh, samples remain from, from that study. Uh, and the next morning I got up and there was an email from Jim Cox saying, delighted to hear from you, I am the Jim Cox that you're looking for, and I think I have the samples that you're looking for. And, and so they were kept as family heirlooms. Um, that's a family photo of, of the pathologist from the paper. I've, I've stayed at their house now in the Lake District. They're like the nicest people. Uh, and we're going to screen these uh, slides, and, and maybe we'll find um, H1N1 uh, genes. Most likely we'll find nothing, but there's a chance that we'll be able to push this date back further. Um, and just in the last 30 seconds, let me suggest that the, it's possible that the 1918 virus um, goes all the way back to 1915, which I'm not going to make you put your hands up again, um, but 19, the, the winter of 1915-16 was a terrible one for flu. Uh, so here's Chicago, uh, 1,400 uh, and 40 cases of pneumonia reported this month, 666 deaths. 201 deaths within the last four days. If you just saw that, you'd think they're talking about the 1918 pandemic. Uh, Pennsylvania, similarly, a um, uh, great many of the various services of the city have been badly crippled by the number of cases. To me, that suggests um, younger adults rather than elderly adults. Um, and, uh, and I'll just leave you to read this, this quote here. Um, but I think this idea that the 1915-16 outbreak uh, of, of influenza may have had something to do with the 1918 outbreak is, is one that um, deserves some, some consideration. And with that, I'll thank you. And we have eight minutes or so for questions. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mike, for a great talk. Um, any questions? Thank you, that was a wonderful talk. Um, thinking about your slide where you showed um, everybody from the elderly to a baby, and you were talking about H1 being among the elderly, H3N8 among the adults, I think 25 to 34 or such. What evidence do you have uh, for the H3N8 and the so, H1? So that, that's among a great question. Um, so this goes back to the research by a, a Dutch guy named Nick Mazarel who published uh, a series of really wonderful papers uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. He went to old folks' homes in the Netherlands and took blood samples from thousands of people. Um, and what he was able to show when equine H3N8 emerged in 1963, he was able to show that this cohort born from about 1890 to 1900 uh, had uh, almost all of them had antibodies against the equine H3. So this is, this is work done before H3 had reemerged in the 1960s, and there's no reason that those individuals should have had H3 antibodies unless they were exposed uh, as kids. Um, and the same thing, N8, um, shows the same uh, pattern. And so it's indirect. We know there was a pandemic epidemiologically in 1890, 1889 to 92. Uh, and we know that same uh, uh, birth year cohort has H3 antibodies. So that's, that's, the, that's the evidence. Um, we know a little bit actually going as far back as the 1889 pandemic. There's a beautiful paper in uh, PNAS uh, where a group got uh, public health records from Russia all across Western Europe and from the United States. Uh, and there's an animation where you can see this wave that travels at, it looks just like what you might think happened in 1918. Um, 
so, so as far back as the Russian flu pandemic, uh, my guess is that flu had this sort of cosmopolitan um, uh, phenotype that we see nowadays. But certainly if you go far enough back in time, the world must have been um, sort of broken into uh, disconnected geographies such that maybe totally different um, subtypes circulated in, in China in, in the 1400s uh, or 1300s than were circulating in Western Europe. Um, so it's a good, a good question. Modern flu patterns probably go back at least to the Russian flu pandemic though. Uh, hi, Mike. Great, great talk. Um, it, it seems that the co-circulation of H1N1 and H3 and 2 right now might protect us from severe pandemic because we have co-circulating strains from each clade. So is there a concern that a universal vaccine, uh, a universal flu vaccine would make us more susceptible to a severe pandemic? Um, I, I agree that co-circulation of, of a group 2 and group 1 virus actually probably does have this unexpected benefit um, and uh, I don't I, I hesitate to frame any of this in terms of concerns about vaccines for, for obvious reasons uh, but I, I think um, it is important to start to think about the connection between uh, these sorts of interventions and the long-term consequences um, and, the, and the research that is going to be done, uh, funded by the NIH to follow these cohorts, I think is part of exactly what needs to be done. I don't think you can ignore that there's an, an important component that is set up by your first infection. Uh, how that plays out now with vaccines is something that needs careful thought, for sure. There was a, a great talk. I was wondering, to, to what extent uh, is the effect of imprinting uh, on susceptibility to the opposite group impacted by um, subsequent infection by that other group? So we don't know the answer to that yet, and, and we are going to, um, uh, the, the science paper that I talked about was very much what I'll call an original antigenic sin, where it's the first virus in that is the only thing that you consider. Uh, we are going to follow up with a, an antigenic seniority uh, model, to, to borrow Justin Lessler's term, where you know maybe the first one has the most effect, and then the second one has some effect but less, and so on. Um, the indications so far are that the first one is hugely dominant. Uh, and if there is an effect of secondary ones, it's probably kind of minor. Um, the, I, I won't go back to it. The, the reason I think that there might be some secondary infection, or you know, second, third infection component is if you go back to 1918, uh, if you follow this idea that it's the first infection or infections that are giving you protection uh, or, or added susceptibility, that added susceptibility goes out beyond 10-year-olds, um, people born 10 years before the 1889 putative H3 outbreak. Uh, but virtually all of us nowadays are infected by H7 with our first flu. So if you, if you see what I'm saying, it, it suggests that maybe the second uh, infection does also play a role. And then this seems important for calculating vaccine effectiveness, modulating the VE uh, calculations by kind of the underlying susceptibility on the basis of what you've seen. Yeah, first. yeah, and that's sort of a, a take home point of this talk is this idea that we have pre existing immunity, even from different subtypes, affects everything. It affects that, it affects, you know, I, I don't take seriously any animal study where um, you're giving the virus to a completely naive animal, um, except for <clears throat> very young people, um, our experience with influenza is almost always as a secondary, not secondary, 
it's, it's not the first time we've seen the virus. Uh, and, and so I'd be much more interested uh, in, a, in a study of the in, innate uh, virulence of the reconstructed H1N1 from 1918 if it, was, if it were given as the second infection to a group of animals that had either been pre-infected with H1 or H3. And I think... Uh, uh, just one more question. So you believe it is solely an effect of the very first infection rather than a critical period in childhood? So say you had two strains circulating at the same time and a very small child could be infected with either or both. Would it get the protective effect for both or just for one of them? Um, my, my money would be on um, it's the first one in and it's not about a critical period. It's just that most of us get our first infection when we're kids, um, but it's not uh, possible to exclude uh, the, the idea that um, it, there is actually a critical period um, and any virus that you see in, the, in, in that period gives you protection. But the, the, the protection susceptibility is so dramatically shifted around either side of the emergence of 19, the 1968 H3 that I do think it's probably just the first virus that you get. Um, but yes, I think we'd better okay, stop. Yes. Thank, you, thank you very much thank and, you. Uh, uh, yeah, for a great talk. <laughs> okay, we have to move on.